afternoon. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> Never know for sure if that's going to happen. So. But you're a great group. I was very impressed with the silence this morning after the presentation. That often that does not happen. People start talking right away. So that was beautiful. Uh, ben, I think it's very important that we have those periods of silence so that the <clears throat> message that we're trying to put across today is, as I said this morning, not so much to affect our minds as to affect transformation in our hearts and our spirits. So we need that quiet time to make that happen. This afternoon, um, to start with, I hope to point out how different uh, what John Paul II said in 1991 was from previous Catholic teaching. In 1991, as you remember, and he was quoting Paul VI from 1965, war never again, no, no more war. It, it just can't be part of our, our religious commitment any longer. And uh, and that is a tremendous change because for over 1600 years within the Christian community, with some few exceptions, so peace churches like the Mennonites and a few others, uh, the Christian community had accepted war. But then we have people like John Paul saying that so clearly we, war just can't be within the framework of a of, of religious Christian community. Um, <clears throat> And he is uh, kind of, when he said that, that was like the culmination of changes that had been taking place uh, for, well, since uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third in 1963 uh, had written an encyclical letter called Pacem in Teres, Peace on Earth. And that letter uh, attracted worldwide uh, attention because it was such a clear approach to how to build peace in the world and eliminate war. And it's the first time that there was such an elaborate, well thought out and carefully written document like this from a Catholic uh, uh, bishop of Rome. But, and in, in that, it's a long document, or and, and it, it's mostly about how to build peace, not just against war. But probably most of you are, are, are aware that starting in the fourth century, or the fifth century, I should say, contrary to what the Christian community for the first 300 years had followed, which was a way of nonviolence, a way of active love, uh, following the way Jesus himself had taught and lived. Uh, in the fifth century, for, under St. Augustine, um, the, the um, or actually the late fourth century and early fifth century, um, he developed a, a different theology, uh, which we call the just war theology. And, and yet that theology was not meant to really approve war, but it was to prevent war from happening, or if it did happen, to try to keep limits on the war. And so Augustine wasn't simply repudiating the teachings of Jesus, but he was trying to deal with a situation where violence was uh, everywhere. It was the time of the breakup of the Roman Empire. Augustine lived in North Africa where there were immigrations going on much violence, much turmoil, and so it seemed like violence was everywhere, and so he, but he, his concern was to prevent that if possible. And then, but if you couldn't prevent it, then control it to some extent. And so he developed this theology, which we call just war theology. But it started with the premise that Jesus himself had rejected violence. He, Augustine never taught against that. But he began to try to say, well, there may be circumstances in which, if necessary, you might, might have to set aside the teaching of Jesus in that regard and approve of war. But, uh, but then that 
got further developed over the centuries and actually to the point where um, in modern times the, the whole theology was more in just in words than in any practice. We would go to war without Christian communities debating the question hardly at all. In fact, in, you know, as I was growing up, I was growing up during World War II, and my <clears throat> I had a number of siblings, and my, three of my older brothers were all drafted into World War II, and, and my family was a very Catholic family, and, and yet my parents, my brothers, none of them thought that, well, maybe a Christian should not be doing this, because it had become so commonplace that, uh, well, you had to defend your country. You had to be patriotic. And even if you were, uh, if you were a good citizen, you could be a good Christian. If you're a good Christian, you would be a good citizen. It was almost intertwined. So we never thought that maybe you shouldn't go to war. But, um, and that was because this theology of just war seemed to have taken such a strong hold within the Catholic and throughout most of the Christian community. Well, that all began to change, as I said, with John the 23rd in 1963. But then, especially with what John started, uh, and you may be familiar with the Vatican Council II, which uh, was a gathering of all the Catholic bishops of the world to come to Rome to discuss various aspects of Catholic teaching and to kind of create a vision, a direction for the Catholic Church. And during that council, one of the most important documents was a document called uh, The Church in the Modern World. And in this uh, document, uh, the, the bishops of, of the council made very strong statement about war. Then they had been developing the teaching on war, and then they say, with these truths in mind, this most holy council makes its own the condemnation of total war already pronounced by recent popes and issues the following declaration. Any act of war aimed indiscriminately at the destruction of entire cities or of extensive areas along with their population is a crime against God and against humankind. It must it merits unequivocal and unhesitating condemnation. The, the whole thing that had happened during World War II, where it became total war, the bishops at the council are teaching for the Catholic Church, that cannot be accepted. That, that was the first really strong, clear statement, not just by a pope, but by all the bishops of the world acting together. And from that point on, there has been a constant development in Catholic teaching against war. Um, I, I'll just mention a few things that to me are very striking. Um, for example, 1976, Pope Paul VI wrote a, a statement about war and peace in which at one point he talks about Hiroshima and he describes it in terms that it, you, you almost sense he's trying to come up with a term that makes you realize the horror, the evil of this event. And he calls it a butchery of untold magnitude. What we did at Hiroshima. And that was, that was he published that uh, Peace Day Statement in 1976. So it was quite a long time after World War II. But it, and it was really the first clear condemnation uh, by name of Hiroshima. What I quoted from the council, which was 1964, they had talked about indiscriminate bombing of cities and so on, which was implicitly condemning Hiroshima. But 1976, Paul says it was a butchery of untold magnitude. And then he goes on to say, and who is the model of peace for our time? And he says, the poor, weak man, Gandhi. Which is extraordinary. Here's the Bishop of Rome, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, is holding up as a model for Christians, a Hindu, 
because that Hindu, Gandhi, really had understood and clearly taught and acted out a teaching against war, that uh, a teaching of how love can overcome violence and hatred. And so it becomes a model for Christians themselves. And then there are a number of other statements. Well, one of, one of the strongest was John Paul II when he spoke to or uh, wrote a, another Peace Day statement in which he says, I invite all Christians to bring to the common task, that is, of building peace, the specific contribution of the gospel. And he says, in the light of that gospel, I was able to say, and I now repeat, he had been to Ireland and he made a statement there, and he says, I now repeat, violence is a lie, for it goes against the truth of our faith, the truth of our humanity. Do not believe in violence. Do not support violence. It is not the Christian way. It is not the way of the Catholic Church. Believe in peace, forgiveness, and love. Only these are of Christ. And so you have a very clear statement saying, violence simply isn't the way to follow Jesus. You can't follow Jesus and expect to use violence in any way. Um, and, and again, there's more and more of those, but I don't want to take too much time just giving you Catholic teaching because it's more important to go to the real source, and that is to the scriptures. But let me just share with you one more. And it was probably the, the last public uh, statement of, uh, well it was, the last public statement of Pope John Paul uh, against violence, against war. It was in uh, May of, of uh, 2004, within the year of, he, he died within the following year. And he, he had gone to Spain to speak, uh, well, to make one of his international trips. And as he always did on those trips, he met with young people. And he really interacted with them, engaged them in uh, and always brought out the question of war and peace. And on this occasion, um, it was shortly after the Second Persian Gulf War had started, and the reporter describing this event says about John Paul, still filled with a palpable sadness over the war in Iraq. It was going on at that point, and he had tried so hard to persuade President Bush. He sent one of his top assistants to talk to the president, and also to talk to President Hussein in Iraq. And it, the talks came to nothing. Nothing happened. And so the reporter says, still filled with palpable sadness over the war in Iraq, Pope John Paul II told an audience of hundreds of thousands of young, young people in Spain uh, that what he desperately wanted for the world was peace. Repeating that word so often that it became a mantra, he kept saying to these young people, we need peace, the world must have peace work for peace, we need peace. And he kept on just repeating that man mantra. But then he went on to say, beloved young people, you know well how concerned I am about peace in the world. And then he uh, said to them, or he deplored what he called a spiral of violence, terrorism, war, and begged them, be artisans of peace. He deplored all this violence, the war that's going on, and begged these young people, be artisans of peace. Respond to violence and inhuman hatred with the fascinating power of love. And I, I think those terms are very uh, powerful. Be artisans of peace. What does that mean? Well, an artist is someone who has a vision 
a dream, a hope. The artist can see, you know, like, in fact, in a novel about Michelangelo, he's described as looking at a block of stone. You know, and he see, I mean, we would see a block of, of marble. He sees David. So he chips away at the marble until David emerges. I mean, that's one way to envision how an artist works. He has this image, this vision, this dream, you could call it. But then he works to make it come forth. And so that's what John Paul was begging. Be artisans of peace, and saying that to all of us. And then uh, keep your, um, respond to violence and hatred with the fascinating power of love. That's the only way you're going to change the world. Not through violence, only through the transforming power of love. And so these are the kinds of teachings that we've had in, in the church now since the, the end of World War II. And, and they, uh, it's very clear that within the Catholic Christian tradition, war is not acceptable. And we should be proclaiming that from all of our pulpits all the time. It's just not acceptable. It's not in agreement with God's will. It's not in agreement with Catholic teaching. We have to go against that. And so that means that every one of us, if we're willing to explore this, will find ourselves searching for that path to how to be converted. And, and I really mean a deep conversion in your heart. Um, because you know, we could talk about this kind of on an intellectual basis, and and uh, and there are those who have done this, just trying to like Dr. Eugene Sharp at uh, uh, Harvard University developed a whole uh, teaching, which he taught classes in for years on the. Uh, giving up violence and instead defending uh, a nation by uh, acts of nonviolence, developing what he called the defense system that made it impossible for an attacker to be successful. And he, he explicitly said, I'm not doing this out of religious basis, it just can be very effective. And he had many ways in which he showed how you can defeat an aggressor by acts of civil disobedience that make it impossible to be successful. See, for example, one, and he has many of these, but in World War II in Denmark, the King of Denmark was opposed to Hitler and to Hitler's invading armies. And, and the people were too, but the king gave the leadership. He began to wear a Star of David. And every citizen was encouraged, wear a Star of David. The Nazis can't then pick out the Jews and kill them. Everyone, in a sense, becomes a Jew. And, and so something like that. And, and so the, the Nazis were frustrated in, in Denmark because everyone identified himself or herself as a Jew. And they, they didn't want to take all the people away. They couldn't because then the country wouldn't be worth anything to them. So they were frustrated. But Dr. Sharp develops these kinds of uh, teachings that uh, nonviolent civilian-based defense, he calls it, rather than just coming to a logical or intellectual conclusion. Back during World War II again, um, there was resistance movement in Germany and uh, uh, against Nazi, uh, against Hitler and the Nazi regime. Uh, not uh, a, a lot. I mean, the German. Germany basically was a Christian nation. Uh, almost 80% of the people were Christian, either Lutheran for the most part or Catholic, and uh, and, and yet they followed Hitler uh, quite readily. But there were those who did uh, resist, and one of them was a pastor, Martin Niemuller, and became part of a resistance group and ended up, because of his preaching, in the Dachau concentration camp. And uh, uh, while he was in that camp, 
he underwent a, a very profound confusion. He, he had been a conversion. He had been against Hitler, but not in, in the, uh, the deep way that he ha happened to him in, while he was in prison. Um, he, he, he talked about this in sermons after the war when he preached against war. And one of his sermons, which he gave here in the United States, he says, when I was a boy, Later during World War I, the Sermon on the Mount was seen as suspended for the duration of our earthly existence. <clears throat> and that, I think, was the attitude of many people. Oh yeah, the Sermon on the Mount, that's beautiful, isn't it? Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, blessed are the peacemakers, thou shalt not kill, and so on. I mean, thou shalt not even be angry with your brother or sister. The Sermon on the Mount, beautiful, but idealistic. See, and that's what Martin Niemöller is saying. The Sermon on the Mount was seen as suspended for the duration of our earthly existence. Theologians spoke openly of a moratorium on the Sermon on the Mount, not realizing that by doing so, they were giving Hitler his brand of fascism a green light by saying, how can you love your neighbor in this world? The kind of love Jesus preached was postponed to another world after this life. And if you think about it, maybe many of us have sort of had the same attitude, or at least you'll, you'll find it in almost any uh, church, Christian church. People say, oh yeah, of course, what Jesus says, that's beautiful. And, and of course, when we get to heaven, everybody will love one another. But Jesus meant it for now, not for later. He was teaching to a world where he himself was involved in a situation of violence to an occupying army, and yet he totally preached against violence. And so Martin Niemöller says, talking about what happened to him then in that prison camp where everything changed. It was a moment of great significance for me when from my bunker cell in the Dachau concentration camp, I saw a fellow prisoner being hanged outside the window. I immediately thought, the poor fellow. And then I thought, this damn gang of murderers. He hated the Nazis. So he called them damn gang of murderers. But then, suddenly, a question bolted through my whole being. What if Jesus had thought and expressed such a revengeful thought as he was hanging on the cross? Then there would be no wholeness, no peace, no forgiveness. Jesus meant what he preached in all seriousness, in all honesty, and knew full well who we are in our mortal existence when he proclaimed, blessed are the peacemakers. And so he says, back then in Dachau, I learned to love my enemies. I could call it, or just as well call it a conversion, but it was not I who converted. Rather, inadvertently being a witness to the way human beings treat fellow human beings, seeing what people can become capable of and dedicated to when a so-called duty becomes their higher authority, that literally turned me inside out, converted me. See, so in a matter of an instant almost, he underwent this profound change. It's a conversion. He didn't reason himself to it. He suddenly realized what God was saying through Jesus. And I'll tell you, a much more recent example of sort of the same thing. A young man whom I came to know in the last few years, and perhaps you've heard of him because he became very active in the peace movement. His name is Joshua Castile. Now Joshua was a young man who grew up uh, in a military family, and, and he was uh, committed to the military life himself. He went to West Point, did very well, graduated officer, and he was sent to Iraq. Uh, and he had great skill in languages, and so 
he had learned Arabic and he became an interpreter in the Abu Ghraib prison. And I heard, I heard him describe this, uh, how there in that prison, you remember the, the scandal of that prison, uh, how the prisoners were so mistreated uh, in very terrible ways. And it was his job to interrogate them. He wasn't part of those who beat up the prisoners and so on. But he said how the, the, when they were brought to him for interrogation, they had already been roughed up by our, the, the guards, the U.S. troops, so that they'd be ready to talk. And he also said how these, most of them, he discovered as he interrogated them, that they were just young people who had been randomly picked up and accused of being uh, enemies. And, and so then they were used to try to get information from them. Uh, and so they would be brought to him. And he would do the interrogation, trying to discover more what, what he could, whatever information they might have about where, who were setting up the IEDs and so on. And uh, one time, he said, a prisoner stopped him. And he said, you're a Christian. And Joshua said, yeah. And so then this prisoner began to quote to him the Sermon on the Mount. He said, that's what Jesus taught. Don't you believe that? <laughs> and Joshua was really stunned almost because he hadn't thought about it. Suddenly he began to interact with this prisoner, not just as someone there in front of him as an unnamed person, but as a real person. And he began to talk about his family and ask him questions about his family and so on. He began to act, interact with them on a very human level. But most of all, he had been challenged. Don't you believe what Jesus said? And so Joshua was really underwent a conversion. Within a matter of a couple of weeks, he knew he could no longer do what he was doing. And he went and, uh, to his superiors and said, I can't do it. In fact, I must leave the, the military. So he sought a uh, conscientious objection status and, and got it. And then he began to dedicate his life to preaching against war, against violence. He died already, he was only 32, mm -hmm. and probably part of the reason he died was because he was, when he was waiting to be cleared to be released from the army, he was put on a detail that had to clean up debris where there had been explosions and of our shells that had depleted uranium. And he picked up radiation sickness mm -hmm. and died <clears throat> at 32. But the few years that he lived after he came back, four or five years, he spent his life trying to proclaim this message uh, that, that you must reject violence if you follow Jesus. And so uh, I tell these stories only to emphasize the fact that if we're going to be converted, turned around inside out, it will come through reflection, through prayer, through we trying to understand truly what Jesus said, how he acted. And as we do that in prayer, we can be changed so that we will want to dedicate our life completely to struggling for peace, not through war, not through violence, but only through love. And It is clear in the Gospels and the other Christian scriptures that Jesus rejected violence and that he expected his followers to do the same. A scripture scholar, John McKinsey, uh, wrote a book that had a great influence on me. It's called The New Testament Without Illusions. 
the, the New Testament without illusion. In other words, he, he's sort of saying, you know, the New Testament has been kind of watered down, made easier. He's saying, you get, take it as it radically is, and it's going to be a huge challenge. And in that book, he focuses on a few issues, mostly. One being the whole question of poverty and wealth and how a Christian lives the blessed are the poor beatitude. But also on obedience and authority, how people who are in positions of authority must try to help people to grow through love, not through power. And that's a very difficult Christian thing. But most of all, he would, he, he, that I found so challenging was his statement, if Jesus did not reject violence for any reason whatsoever, we know nothing about Jesus. See, in other words, he says in the scriptures, in the gospels, if you really listen to what Jesus says, if you really look at how he acted, then you must say he rejected violence. Or else you have to say none of what we read in the Gospels is, is, makes much sense. If he did not reject violence, then we don't know anything about what he did or did not do. Because it's so clear. And, and John, John McKinsey says, Jesus taught us how to die, not how to kill. He taught us how to die not how to kill. And isn't that true? He died loving those putting him to death. Don't just love those who love you. Love your enemies. That's what he had said. And he died loving his enemies. Father, forgive them. Welcome to what we call the good thief into paradise. He died loving those who hated him. So he taught us how to die, not how to kill. And that's easy to verify. And I'll, I'll just, uh, I mean, in the sense of looking at the New Testament, uh, one of the, the Old Testament also, but starting with the New Testament. If you look at what Jesus said, and I'll, I'll, there's so many examples here, but uh, I'll just give it very briefly. The, the Sermon on the Mount, the, the basic set of values that Jesus, where Jesus said, I have come not to abolish the law, the Jewish law, but to fulfill it, to take it beyond. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, where he starts with the, what we call the Beatitudes, um, and sets up value system for Christians. Blessed are the poor, that is those who put their trust in God, not material wealth. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. These are the kinds of things Jesus taught. And then, after the Beatitudes, he says, he begins to teach in this way. You have learned that was said of old. Thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, you must not even be angry in your heart against a brother or a sister. In other words, it isn't just not killing. You also have to root out of your heart any spirit of vengeance, any hatred against another. And he makes it so clear. He says, even if you're going to the altar to offer your gift, in other words, you're coming to worship God, there you remember your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift at the altar. Don't bother to try to worship God. Go first and be reconciled with your brother or sister. Then come and offer your gift. What could be more clear? He's saying the most important thing is reconciliation, it's love, it's forgiveness. If you're not doing those things, don't pretend to worship God. And in fact, that's what he's saying. And 
then he, in that Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, again, love, don't just love your, uh, your neighbor, love your enemy. Do good to those who hurt you. You have heard that it was said of old, uh, if someone strikes you on the one cheek, strike them back. But I say to you, no, turn the other cheek. Deflect the blow instead of reacting with violence. Someone wants you to go one mile, go two. Someone wants you to carry their burden, carry twice as much. Jesus says, always act out of love going beyond what your enemy is demanding. And so he shows us in that Sermon on the Mount how important it is to reject violence and hatred. There's a very powerful example in Matthew's Gospel later on where Jesus has just proclaimed to uh, his disciples it's to, uh, toward the end of his public life and he's on his final trip to Jerusalem and he says to them the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem and there he'll be handed over to his enemies and he'll be tortured put to death and then third day rise again so he, he proclaims this is what's going to happen and and he expects his disciples to accept this and to follow him he's kind of challenging them and Peter however speaks up and says no he rejects what Jesus says no see this isn't all in the gospel but you can understand Peter sort of thinking as many of the followers of Jesus did well he's got this huge following now if we're ready to overthrow the Romans we can start a revolution so why hand yourself over to your enemies be tortured and put to death loving them let's overcome them and when Peter suggests that Jesus stops and says to Peter, get behind me, you Satan, you devil, because you're listening to human words, not to the word of God. See, Peter, thinking he was knew more than Jesus, was going to help him to avoid this horrible death. Jesus said, you're thinking in human ways, not God's ways. And so then he said to Peter and all the disciples, if you want to be my disciple, deny your very self, take up your cross, and follow me. So he makes it clear that's what he expects of them. And uh, throughout, throughout the, the Gospels, you'll find example after example where Jesus teaches this. But then, um, it's even more important, I think, not just to listen to the words of Jesus, but then to look and reflect on how he acted when he was confronted with violence. And this happens, of course, especially in the last week of his life. You know, the night of what we call the Last Supper, the last Passover he celebrated with his whole community. Afterwards he goes, well, during that supper, he says to, uh, to the disciples, one of you will betray me. And it's Judas. So he knows Judas is about to betray him. Violence, if you will. Think about it. Someone who's been your friend, you're very close to, you've shared intimately for over two years, and living, traveling together, preaching together, doing God's work together, and this person is going to betray you. What happened? Just a short time later, the meal is over. Jesus has gone to the garden to pray, to be alone in prayer, you know, dreading what's going to happen. And then the mob comes with Judas in the forefront. And what does Jesus do? He walks up to them calmly, lovingly, and he embraces Judas the one that is betraying him. And he says, friend, he calls him friend, why have you come? He, in a sense, pleading with Judas, don't do it. 
Uh, he would be arrested by the Roman soldiers anyway, but at least Judas would not do it. And Judas doesn't respond. And, you know, we might wonder about that. It's an example of how, well, it doesn't always work. And that's true. Jesus reaching out in love didn't change Judas at that moment. He went away and we learned later, hanged himself. You know, what happened between Judas and God, ultimately, of course, we don't know. But Jesus had forgiven him. At that same meal, Peter, you may remember, uh, proclaims when Jesus says, uh, one of you will deny me. Before the cock crows three times, one of you will deny me. And they say, I, Lord, I, Lord. And Peter says, even if everybody else denies you, I'll never deny you. Well, a few hours later, after Jesus is arrested and being tortured, and taken from one place to another in the, the Roman Praetorium, in Luke's Gospel, he looks across this open uh, hallway or space, and Peter, he sees him, and Peter looks at Jesus, and it must have been a look of forgiveness and love. There are no words, just this profound look into each other's eyes, and Jesus is forgiving Peter, and Peter realizes it because here, Peter goes out and weeps bitterly. The love Jesus offers to him transforms him and he realizes how wrong he was because he had indeed denied Jesus three times. So that's how Jesus acts and of course as he's tortured, scourged, crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross, executed in one of the most ignominious and cruel ways that a person could be executed. Uh, the whole time he's not crying out in anger or fear or hatred. He's praying for those who are around him. He prays for his mother. He offers his mother to John for her, to keep care of her and take uh, John to be her son. He reaches out to the person being executed next to him when he says, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He looks down at those who have tortured him, those who are waiting for him to die. And he loves them. He prays for them. Father, forgive them. And so he's showing us that you return hatred with love, violent with nonviolent. And that transforms the situation. It gradually will make uh, peace happen rather than further violence or hatred. And so Jesus not only speaks the words, he lives and acts in this way. And uh, his first disciples understood this. They, uh, for 300 years, the Christian community, for the most part, if you became a Christian, were baptized, and you were a soldier, you gave up the military career to follow Jesus. And, and that was true for over 300 years. Then gradually it began to change in the Christian uh, understanding. And as I said before, we developed this so-called theology of justifying violence, justifying war. Um, but it, it's so clear what Jesus taught, how he acted, what he wanted us to do. And, uh, but in the early Christian communities, when they followed him, it wasn't always that easy. There is a letter in, uh, that Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth, uh, the first letter to the church at Corinth in the first chapter. Paul is uh, discussing uh, question of, uh, about Jesus and uh, he's telling 
these Christians in this letter, here am I preaching a crucified Christ. Here am I preaching a crucified Christ. See, the Christians might, uh, in this community were beginning to waver, perhaps. And he says, to the Jews, it's a scandal. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. See, the Jews, to see one who claimed to be God, to be humiliated, to be tortured, to be killed, oh, was an absolute scandal. How could God allow that? And to the Greeks, the so supposedly wise people, you know, Greek wisdom, uh, it's just plain foolishness. Paul says, but that's what I have to preach, and that's what I am preaching. See, and the, these Corinthians must have found that very difficult, as we do. But then, and then he says to them, but the weakness of God is stronger than human strength, and the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Those are words, I think, that help us to realize, yes, this does seem foolish. It does seem impractical, not workable. And yet, this foolishness of God is actually the most profound wisdom you can find. And the weakness of God, giving oneself over to the enemy, loving the enemy, call that weakness, but it's stronger than any human strength because that's the power of love and that's what that fascinating power of love can transform our world transform our attitudes transform our whole society and it's the only thing that will transform our world and our society and so if we take the time to pray these passages of the scriptures reflect let that word of God enter into our mind, our heart, our consciousness. Let that word of God be a powerful, what Jesus said, leaven or yeast, you know, that transforms. Uh, let that happen within our hearts. And over a period of time, probably it take some time, it won't be like Martin E. Miller and it instantly suddenly realized how true the gospels were or Joshua Castile being confronted by the Muslim who knew the scriptures and suddenly realizing, yes, that's what I believe, or say I believe, I must be converted to believe it, and he was. So that can happen to us also. And it will be difficult, but many people have done it. Uh, and uh, there are these examples of those who have committed their lives to act of love. Gandhi, the model for people for our times, according to Paul VI. But Martin Luther King, uh, Nelson Mandela, who, you know, in his autobiography, he said, during those long and lonely years, when he was in prison, 27 years, 18 uh, isolation, you know, uh, solitary confinement, nine years plus that. Uh, during those long and lonely years, I came to understand that I had to work as hard for the freedom of my oppressors as for the freedom of the oppressed, my own people. In other words, he's saying, I had to love my oppressors, work for their freedom, love them so I worked for their freedom. Because anyone who holds another person in oppression is a prisoner of hatred in their heart. So he says, I have to work for their freedom, freedom from that hatred, by loving them. And he came out of prison and that's what he did. And even though he had started as a violent revolutionary, he helped to bring about change in South Africa that was a true revolution, breaking up the whole apartheid system and creating a democracy, and it still is going on 20 years later. And it was done not through hatred, not through the violent revolution, but through a nonviolent revolution. And so these things can happen.